one night I had a dream. We were in the old warehouse back in this day and money was tight, you know, and we were just learning how the kingdom operated and applying it. You know, we learned it in our family life. Now the bills were bigger. You know, money's tight in the warehouse days. I had a dream. In this dream, we were having a Christmas event at the warehouse. And so we had some shrubbery outside the, the door there. And I was outside uh, spray painting the shrubbery with that fake snow, you know, you put on the window. That was, you know, I had a spray can and I was spraying the, the bushes out there. I wanted, to make this, I wanted to make the party special, right? So I'm praying the, I mean, spraying the bushes, right? This man who I knew came up behind me in the dream and said, what are you doing? I said, well, I got a party going on. I'm, it's a Christmas party and I'm, I'm spraying the trees white. I want to make it look like snow's on them. And he goes, no, we gotta, you got to do it right. I'll pay for it. And he had multiple dump trucks of real snow brought in and dumped at the front door around the trees. As I was standing there, as the snow was being piled up, these trucks dumped the snow there, and I was standing there with him, all of a sudden, up in the clouds, I saw it looked like a, a tornado forming, but it wasn't black, it was white. And it was spinning, and I, 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 I pointed to it. Out of the tornado, this man owned businesses. Out of the tornado, I saw his business come out of the tornado, and it was huge. And it came down to the earth beside him. After, of course, I met this guy, and this is the dream. I actually met him uh, in, by coincidence, by coincidence, several weeks later, and we talked about what we were doing. He said, I'll pay for that. When he said, I'll pay for that, I felt I could tell him the dream. And today, his business is one of the largest in the United States in, in, the, in the areas that he works in. His business grew just like that dream. Why? Because he con was concerned about God's business, and he paid for it. In my book, I talk about one word that you should remember. In fact, I, I say, if you don't get anything out of my book, I want you to write this word down. And we've talked about it many times here at Faith Life Church, but again, I want to put it in context. What we're saying today is the word sent. In Luke chapter 4, he says, uh, Jesus coming out of the baptism at the River Jordan, goes into his hometown of Nazareth, goes into the synagogue there, grabs the scroll of Isaiah and reads there. They're all amazed. But then he says to them in verse 24, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. Why? Because too familiar. It's familiarity. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to, Zer uh, to, to a widow in Zarephath. Zarephath was a Canaanite town. It was not even part of Israel. What is Jesus doing? He is basically condemning their heart for God. They, because in the story, he was basically saying there's no one in Israel that would have done what this widow does. In 1 Kings chapter 17, we find the story. You know the story of Elijah. There's a, there's a famine, there's a drought. The Holy Spirit says in verse 9 to go to Zarephath, stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he goes, when he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, and please bring me a piece of bread. She says, as surely as the Lord your God lives, she says, I don't have any bread only a handful of flour in a jar, a little oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home, make a meal for myself and my son. That's it. We're out. And Elijah said to her, what? Don't be afraid. But he's going to give her the answer, but he's heading it up by, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you've said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me first. Then Make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. There was food every day for Elijah and the woman and her family. 
Now, I think all of us who've been taught here know what happened. Why would the prophet ask her first to give him bread? Because you know spiritually when she voluntarily gave her her last meal, it changed jurisdiction. Her meal pot now came under the grace of God, the jurisdiction of the kingdom of heaven. And as that happened then, how much did it cost her to give that meal away? Zero. Because as we read, God gives seed to the sower and bread for the eating. You'll find this throughout the entire Bible, that there was food for God's assignment, his purpose, and for that family throughout the entire famine. But it's interesting that Elijah, the prophet, you know, a prophet carries the word of God. The prophet was sent. The Holy Spirit looked across the country, across the land, to find someone who would believe him enough to fund God's assignments. I am sure there were people that died of hunger in that time that could have had that blessing, could have had, but yet they would not receive it. You know, we always look for and hope for, a lot of people look for that multi-million dollar idea. Oh, if I could have just bought this stock at this price back in history, if I would have known what I, you know, if I could have known then, you know, if I could just have that, friend, you have it, it's right here. God has more ideas than you can ever use up. Joining his team is an amazing opportunity. You know, God has assignments here in the earth realm he wants to accomplish. It's all about people. Every assignment needs people. He calls people to his assignments and he calls money to his assignments. God is looking over the earth to find people who'd carry his assignments and fund his assignments. And there's reward with that. You know, one of my favorite scriptures, and again, another parable, is the Good Samaritan. And it's interesting, these parables are named names that are not accurately portraying what God is trying to tell people in these parables. You know, I grew up with a religious mindset and grew up in religious teaching, and no one ever explained the parables to me spiritually. They would just be nice stories that you read about someone doing a good, good, a good deed or something, right? But in Luke chapter 10, we find the story of, of this good Samaritan, and again, I've taught this many times, but it fits into the context of what I believe the Lord is doing this weekend, as along with the same message God has told us to send out the kingdom advance, send the ships out, these small groups across the nations to bring in God's harvest and teach the kingdom. I believe this time period right now, God's heart is to bring his kingdom into the earth in a new way and to touch people's lives, but he needs people to do it. Luke chapter 10 in verse number, uh, verse number 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What's written in the law, Jesus said. How do you read it? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus said, do this and you'll live. But he wanted to justify himself. And who's my neighbor? So Jesus tells us this story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road when he saw the man he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place, saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He, sent, uh, he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring an oil and wine on it. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins, gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Now, as I've said many times, I've heard this story for years and years and years about being a good neighbor, you know, being a good neighbor. But in reality, there's much more to this story than that. And as we talk about this story, you know, the religious folks bypassed this guy because, well, Samaritans were unclean to the Jews. 
And they wanted to make sure they stayed right with God. <laughs> Follow what I'm saying. They want to stay right with God and not help this person. Jesus, of course, is correcting their, their fallacy, their wrong theology. And you'd have to agree that Jesus would do what this Samaritan does. He would care for the person, which the story says. But the interesting fact is Jesus goes to him, bandages his wounds with oil and wine, which is a, a prophetic look at what he would eventually do anyway through the blood covenant and the, the life of the Holy Spirit. But then he takes him to an inn and pulls out silver and says, take care of this guy and whatever it costs, I'll pay for it. Now, I want you to understand that and grab this sentence, whatever it costs, I'll pay for it. Whatever it costs, I'll pay for it. Now, that's God speaking. This is what God would do. Whatever it costs, I'll pay for it. How valuable are people to God? He loved the world so much that he sent Jesus to die for, for us, humanity. Everything, whatever it cost. Now, I always like to teach it this way. You know, religiously, duty, you owe it to God to take care of this guy. Hey, this guy needs help, right? But I don't want to teach Sunday school this week. I don't want to go to the kids' ministry. You know, but oh, I signed up to be a greeter this week. Oh, I, I guess I have to go. I guess it's my duty to go. Well, we appreciate that. <laughs> but you are sadly missing the entire point. So when someone's born again, they're damaged. The world, we all are damaged in the world. We apply the oil, the Holy Spirit, life, you know, the, the new life of God. But we're still carrying the wounds and still carrying the wrong perception of life. We need a place to heal and to learn what the kingdom's really like. God sets people in the local church under a pastor. Now, Jesus is a chief pastor, which means shepherd. But Jesus, according to Ephesians chapter 4, appoints shepherds to watch over his people and to help them on their journey. So God assigns these people that in the world, when they come to Christ, he assigns them under a shepherd, under a pastor, or in this story, we could say, to an inn. He brings them to an inn. They're still damaged. This is why he says, you know, no matter what it costs, he has to heal. He can't travel yet. He's got to become whole again. But Jesus places him under the care of an innkeeper. Now, religion would say, hey, you owe it to God to give. It's a sacrificial offering. You ever heard that? It's a sacrificial offering. You owe it to God for what he's done to you, right? And so by duty, or loyalty or whatever, we could willingly kind of follow up on our commitment. But we miss the whole point of the silver coins. God pays. And the innkeeper knew something that we need to understand. The innkeeper's in business to make money. So when he charges that daily rate, he's built in the cost of the maid servant, the meals. But he's also added on top of that what? You actually said that. Prophet's a nasty word to say in church and prophet. So. <laughs> what? You're going to charge us for books, Pastor Gary? The gospel's free. Well, the book wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> so this innkeeper, now think about what I'm saying. This innkeeper does not look upon that as a distraction or an obligation of duty that he regrets being involved with, does he? He thinks it is the best, the greatest news of his day. Because not only did the guy give him two silver coins, he said, whatever it cost. What is the innkeeper going to do? He's going to tell this guy, because the guy's leaving down the street. If you see some more guys like this down the street, bring them to me. And if I don't have room, I'll add on. I'll buy more land. I'll build more buildings. Just keep them coming. Because he understands 
prophet. It's crazy. Christians have been taught that God doesn't think that way. They think only in terms of duty, that God is not a rewarder. And you have to understand that when you get involved with God's projects and you get involved with funding God's heart for people, everything changes. Hi, I'm Gary Cassie, and you will never fulfill your destiny until you fix your money thing. Visit GaryCassie.com and don't forget to hit the subscribe button below for more amazing weekly videos on fixing your money thing. And thanks for watching.